Coming up on Digital Music Trends 184, recorded on the 21st of May 2014, Soundtrack Your Brand's co-founder joins us to chat about Spotify business, Twitter considered buying SoundCloud, the Deadmau5 iOS app and an interview with the CEO of Upfront, the company behind it, a lawsuit hits Beats Music, the Michael Jackson hologram, an extract of my interview with Jeremy Silver from this week's One to One show, the majors make an investment in Shazam and the Love Live TV launches on LG Smart TVs. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. I'm Andrea Leonelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and DMT is available as an audio and a video show on a variety of channels including the iTunes Store, most podcasting apps including Downcast, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud and many more. And if you'd like to receive a weekly mail out that lets you know when the show is out and what we talk about each week, you can sign up from bit.ly slash DMT DMT list. Again, it's a bit.ly slash DMT list. And don't forget that DMT needs your feedback. If you want to comment on a story or point me in the direction of a piece of news that I might have uh, missed, uh, please do email Andrea at digitalmusictrends.com or tweet at digimusictrends. And this week we are absolutely drowning in news, so I don't want to waste any more time and I want to introduce my guests. So for the first time on the show, uh, Christian cargill Kinney, uh, a lawyer Yay. who is a partner at the firm Leclerc Ryan and uh, the chair of entertainment law industry team. So Christiane is also a great artist in her own right, so go and check her out. There's some uh, fantastic albums online by her, and it's a pleasure to have you on. How's it going? It's going good. Thanks for having me. So you're in LA today, right? I am. Great. Awesome. At home. <laughs> <laughs> you can see pictures of my kids in the background. <laughs> nice. And uh, uh, it's also a real pleasure to welcome back Alejandro Marin uh, on the show all the way from Bogota. Alejandro is a popular DJ in Colombia at uh, La Mas Musica Station and uh, runs a blog on the music industry in uh, uh, Spanish, which, which you can find on themusicpimp.com. So hi, Alejandro, and thanks for uh, joining us. How's it going? Hi, Andrea. Uh, nice uh, being here with you again after couple reschedules we yeah. could make it the other day but it's, it's great. great to have it it's it's great to be here again yeah it's great to have you uh, once again and uh, uh, last but not least uh, i'd like to introduce uh, andreas uh, andreas lifgarden who is a co-founder of soundtrack your brand and andreas used to work uh, in business development at spotify so hi andreas and thanks for joining us hi thanks for having me it's great to have you, and uh, uh, so we're in, in three different continents uh, uh, with uh, Christian in LA, Alejandro in Bogota, and Andreas in Stockholm, and I'm in London. It's it's going to be quite a fun one, and hopefully nothing will break in, in the process, <laughs> <laughs> at least not anymore. <laughs> and uh, uh, I want to start by talking actually about your company, Andreas. That's the reason why you're joining us. Uh, uh, and uh, you made some headlines uh, uh, yesterday with Soundtrack Your Brand, as it's the first product uh, which... Uh, uh, sort of offers a Spotify with a commercial license. It's called Spotify Business. And, uh, you know, we want to hear all about uh, the product and also your first funding round. So can you tell us a little bit about your uh, background and how the company got started first? Absolutely. So uh, I met a guy called Daniel back in 2006. And he tried to recruit me to a company that he was uh, building then called Spotify, and nobody knew nothing about it. Right. And uh, it was until 2008 when I joined him and started working with, with him. And you, you obviously know where the story leads to. And, <laughs> yeah. and today they just announced that they're now 10 million paying sales, which is really amazing. But over all these years uh, doing business development for Spotify, there was one question that we always got. How can I use Spotify in my commercial environment? Could be bars, hotels, retail brands and fashion and so on and so forth. And I was always the one to say no. Uh, we had a huge focus on doing telecom deals, and still they still do. And there are also a huge focus on doing hardware deals, getting Spotify into mobile phones and cars and stereos and so on and so forth. But once you said no about a hundred times or so to big brands, yeah. you sort of grow an affinity. So how do we actually start saying yes to this? Because there is an opportunity. So that was one, one thing that we had. The other one was that uh, we sort of saw where is the industry going next? Um, it might be premature to say that we crack the code for consumer music and digital. There's still a lot to be done there. But the next frontier could definitely be in business-to-business -business or background music. Right. And, 
And the third uh, component in this puzzle was that uh, my co-founder, Ola Sars, uh, who was also a co-founder of Beats Music, uh, we've been trying to recruit each other for quite some time. And we got together last year and we started chatting about what was the next big thing. And when, when we said background music and how brands and fans can connect through music, we just said that's something we need to do. Yeah. And um, that was about a year ago. And with, since then, we funded the company, uh, founded the company. Uh, we got together in a partnership with, with my previous employer, Spotify, and we launched yesterday. That's awesome. And so, uh, you know, talking about... Uh what uh, you know if people uh, that are listening to the show or watching the show uh, don't know exactly what what a standard spotify subscription consists of and or covers and what your company covers can, can you tell us the difference in a, in a bit more detail uh, as to what the commercial license entails absolutely and i think that it's very very important to understand that spotify has always been a consumer service right and that means that you can use Spotify for your personal use. But as soon as you want to play music in a commercial venue, in a commercial setting, such as a bar or cafe or hairdresser or up until up, up to retail stores and so on and so forth, you actually need a B2B license. Right. And that is something that Spotify have not had. And we are the first one who can provide that license. So you can use Spotify fully licensed and legal in your commercial environment. That's, that's, that's really, really interesting because uh, uh, I, I'm sure I've seen uh, stores and bars that use Spotify, but uh, I guess that was, is, is, not, uh, is not legal. So it'd be great if they could actually do that uh, uh, through the app. And, uh, and one of the things that's interesting, actually, is that you've sort of reworked, you worked uh, uh, with the actual Spotify client, but you've added a few new features, right? Absolutely. So what we found after having spoken to several hundreds of small and, and business owners and smaller stores is that when they use Spotify, which is then actually not legal, but when they do, uh, they have a huge problem by having to swap playlists all the time. So I, we actually built a music schedule that allows the store to plan their whole week. And it's a, you, I mean, it's a, spot, a normal Spotify interface, but we also add on a normal calendar interface to right. it. So you can basically schedule your, your playlist. You can have smoother music in the morning, more lively music in the afternoon, or when the kids come in at McDonald's on a Sunday afternoon, we play family-oriented music. If it's a late Friday night, you, you know the music that goes with that. So the music schedule really helps our customers to plan their week and not being busy with changing music all the time. They actually have stuff to sell yeah, yeah absolutely and christiana from, from your end uh, do you feel like uh, of course the service is, uh, is uh, limited to sweden uh, right now but uh, do you feel like in the u.s uh, this is something that uh, uh, there's a demand for and could catch on i definitely think business owners um outside of los angeles and new york and some of the hubs that are a little more knowledgeable about music law um, I've had friends that run businesses and have no idea they play music in their businesses and they, they don't know that they need to license it. <laughs> they don't know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that they need licenses from all of the PROs. So I think this would be exciting for them and it really matches the consumer model that Spotify already started as far as really, you know, that I think it would be of great interest to business owners because it's easy. It's yeah. very simple for them to execute and I, I like the idea of the playlist so that they can plan everything out and not have to worry about it. Yeah, yeah, and of course, if you have any questions, uh, guys, for Andreas, uh, fire away. And uh, Alejandro, on your end, do, do, you know, is, uh, uh, do shops in, in Colombia also require a license to play music? And if so, do you think that, that this could be an interesting proposition for them? Oh, yeah, definitely. I think it's very important for Spotify to get that done as soon as possible because, as Andreas said uh, earlier on, there's a big opportunity for doing business for them here yeah. in Latin America and in Colombia, as well as for the Deezer people, you know, this is something that they that, that it's been talked about ever since the streaming platform started getting here, but we don't really know how to go about, you know, doing it because there, the regulations here all pertain to uh, terrestrial radio royalties and the execution royalties and right. all all the traditional media royalties and rights that come along with, you know offering music uh, services on the radio or on video. Yeah. But in terms of what's going on commercially, it's, it's still a bit blurry. You know, the, the lines yeah. are very blurred. So once Spotify gets on the ball with this and once uh, Andreas gets, you know, that ball running and going, 
in uh, Europe, I think it's just a matter of time bec before you know it, it gets here in Colombia. Yeah, sure. And uh, uh, Andres, I wanted to ask about the, of course, the international rollout. Of course, uh, I mentioned that you are available in Sweden right now. Uh, do you think there's going to be some some roadblocks as far as uh, how the commercial license works in different countries, or is it fairly uh, exportable in a, in a very straightforward manner? When obviously we didn't start this company to be in, in Sweden alone, right? And um, we, of course, like to follow the Spotify footprint. Uh, that being said, uh, Spotify is now a seven, eight-year-old company that has learned a lot and is now highly operational. There are in 56 countries and 10 million subs. Yeah. We, we just started. So we're very humble to the fact that we need to uh, learn the model in Sweden and perfect it before we start exporting it. So we're very the, wary about that. Um, also, at the same time, what we see in, in the, the, uh, the background music line licensing is a very fragmented market. Uh, the distribution technology of background music, uh, I hear two-thirds of all background music in the world is still being served by CD or satellite radio. Right. And when we look at the licensing models compared to the consumer service that you can license almost globally, and it's almost like a streaming license available now that almost any company can get, yeah. more or less. <laughs> uh, on, the, on the B2B side, that's very fragmented. You almost have to do it country by country. So prices vary and the licensing bodies vary country by country. Yeah. So it's going to be really interesting to sort of both grow the market and also mature the market from a lot of different perspectives actually. Absolutely. And of course I, I, I'd want to clarify just in case people were confused while they're listening to this uh, that uh, uh, the usual rates uh, for the collection society still apply so if uh, if you guys were to launch in the UK of course uh, the shops would still have to pay the PRS and, and the PPL for their uh, uh, you know uh, you know rights that they, they need to be paid for uh, on top of the subscription is, is that correct? That is absolutely correct. So the performance fee still applies and the mechanization fees is what we cover on our end. That's great. Awesome. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a real pleasure talking to you today and uh, hopefully we'll hear more uh, from you guys soon. Actually, the last thing I wanted to ask you was uh, around the, the funding of the company. So uh, you got some pretty heavyweight, uh, you know, companies involved, uh, Crandon, Wellington and North Zone, as well as Spotify. So how did you find the environment for uh, uh, looking for funding? Of course, you know, the Spotify connection probably helped, but uh, how do you find the process? It's always demanding to raise, to raise funds, e even though you start with, uh, with, with some good cards in your hand. Uh, I think Ola and I are not the youngest founders on the planet. Uh, so we definitely got that going for us and the background of Spotify definitely helps and, and Ola's Beats background helps as well. But still you need to pay your dues and you need to prove your business case. Um, I think that background music is hugely interesting, especially if you connect it to the fact that the brand investments in the world are somewhere around $550 billion. Right. So if you can tap into that, I think we can do good for the music industry and I think that's what, what our investors saw, saw as well. Yeah, and it makes very, a lot of sense also to uh, to expand on the Spotify ecosystem, um, going after new money instead of uh, perhaps shifting market share within the Spotify ecosystem. Absolutely. So they f they found that very interesting. So. Um, that's what they invested in. That's great. Well, uh, thanks so much, Andreas, uh, again. And uh, go and check out uh, the company. Uh, I'll throw the links in the show notes. Uh, it was a real pleasure talking to you, and I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about uh, this in the coming months. As do we. And uh, I want to stay on Spotify for a couple more minutes because, uh, as Andreas uh, mentioned, uh, the company revealed just about five hours ago uh, the first, uh, for the first time, the subscriber numbers since March 2013. So uh, the last time we heard uh, how many uh, users Spotify had was uh, uh, probably what was it? Uh, 14 months ago, my maths is terrible, uh, about 14 months ago, uh, at the time uh, the company had 24 million users and 6 million paying subscribers, uh, so uh, now the company has reached the 10 million premium subscribers uh, uh, mark uh, with 40 million uh, total users, so 30 million user using the uh, free service and 10 million using the premium one. So, uh, you know, this is really a, an interesting news because we're seeing that the growth is still happening, but it's not as fast as perhaps it was at the beginning. Uh, and and uh, it's important news for Spotify because, of course, the company is looking at uh, a, a potential IPO towards the end of the year. So the announcement could bolster uh, investor interest in the company as well. So, uh, uh, Alejandro, do you feel uh, like uh, this is a, is a real milestone for the company? And, uh, uh, you know, as far as the adoption in Colombia of the service, uh, how is it faring so far? It's only been, it's only been there for a few months, right? 
Yeah, it's been around for about eight months, and it's about to announce uh, a telco bundle. So I right. think everything looks pretty bright for, for Spotify in this territory. I think uh, things are looking up uh, for them. This uh, new announcement, obviously, is very optimistic and full of uh, positive uh, energy for a future IPO. I just uh, don't know exactly how uh, the the money is going to start to show. You know, I mean, right. it's... You know, I, I was speaking to some of the people who work on streaming services and it's still a bit uh, of a dilemma how, you know, the more the service get, gets used, the more money they got to, you know, pull out of their checkbooks or their own financial accounts right. to actually make it work. So uh, as far as the IPO is concerned, I don't know where it's all going. I'm pretty sure that, you know, it's a number to be happy about, but... Yeah. I'm I'm just still thinking about you know where the money is uh, going to come from. <laughs> so essentially, you know what you're saying, which makes a lot of sense, is that uh, as much as the number is important, we'll really have to wait to see what the financials look like and see whether Spotify is starting to close the gap between uh, the growth and and the losses. That uh, you know, it's 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 definitely an important one to get to. Uh, Christian, on your end, uh, how do you feel about the company? Do you feel like this is an important milestone, and can it pave the way to a successful IPO for the towards the end of the year? You know, I. I definitely don't think it hurts. You know, it does show that people are willing to still pay for music as long as it's convenient to them. You know, I mean, people are paying for convenience at this point rather than just focusing on free. And it does show that there's still, you know, a pay for model that works. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's, I think it's definitely a benefit, but you know, there's so many more people that are interested in now, now, now and free. I, I don't know how it's going to be with the IPO. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see. Um, it, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> it doesn't hurt at all, yeah. I yeah. think it's going to be a case of also looking at uh, how the company plans to continue scaling. And Alejandro was mentioning a telco deal, and I think Spotify is going to have to move more and more in this territory if it wants to uh, accelerate the growth of its premium base, uh, which is uh, important. But at this rate, you know, it, it wouldn't be... Uh, particularly fast you know we've seen a, a 4 million premium subscribers added in 14 months so it's not a, a you know a racing fast uh, 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 number uh, of, of users that gets added every month uh, uh, but uh, very good news uh, for, for the streaming world and I'm sure we'll keep an eye on this uh, Spotify is undeniably uh, I guess at this point the biggest uh, streaming music service uh, in the world I, I would doubt there's others that can claim to have 10 million paying users right now and uh, uh, although we started with uh, uh, you know the the soundtrack uh, uh, soundtrack your brand story and uh, the Spotify business story because uh, we had Andreas uh, on the show, which was fantastic. Uh, the actual biggest story of the week, uh, I think, is undeniably uh, the uh, rumor or, or the possibility uh, of Twitter acquiring SoundCloud. So the story was broken Monday night by Peter Kafka on Recode, and uh, he reported that the talks were ongoing, but by no means finalized. And last night, we heard from the Wall Street Journal and a number of other publications that the exclusivity window on the deal had expired, and that Twitter had walked away from it as a number didn't add up apparently so uh, first of all I wanted to look at this from a SoundCloud perspective uh, you know we've talked on the show before about how SoundCloud is likely looking to find a way to uh, get licenses in place for its content uh, it makes sense you know some labels are being pretty vocal about the need for SoundCloud to start paying some money to the to the rights holders and uh, also the company is increasing the focus on its advertising component so in that sense uh, uh, Christian do you think that uh, Twitter would have made it for a good partner and uh, uh, you know where d does this leave SoundCloud Cloud. I could have seen the benefit of it, and Twitter is becoming more and more interested in really breaking into music and, and uh, finding other other avenues to exploit the music, the tons of music users that are on Twitter, and give them opportunities to share. So I think it would have been good for Twitter. Um, I'm not sure with SoundCloud if it was necessarily the ideal fit or match for them. Although I do agree that they're going to have to address the licensing sooner than later. It's just going to become a bigger and bigger problem. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. Alejandro? Yeah, I agree. I agree with Christiane absolutely on that one. I mean, I don't really see where uh, SoundCloud was going to get any benefit from joining uh, Twitter or being bought by Twitter. Maybe the licenses, maybe if Twitter had the pool inside the industry to work the licenses for SoundCloud to work a bit more loosely on on, on different uh, uh, contents that are very hard to get on the SoundCloud as of today, but 
as far as I'm concerned, you know, SoundCloud just works fine by itself. All they got to do is find the right partners to get all those licenses uh, in, in, you know, in, in rule, you know, to, to, yeah. to get their licenses going. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, from our Twitter perspective, you know, that's uh, also an intriguing part of the of the uh, of of the whole uh, story because uh, Twitter, uh, when a Billboard looked at uh, looked at the actual financials of the company, uh, only has about you know only we're talking only, but <laughs> when we deal to billion when we're used to billion dollar deals, you know, that's uh, uh, it sounds like only it has around a billion uh, dollars in cash, uh, one point two billions in short term investments, and an eighteen point four billion market cap. So sounds uh, at the last round of funding was valued around 700 million dollars and I would imagine that the investors would look at having a bit of a premium on top of that especially if uh, uh, Twitter was offering a lot of stock instead of cash as part of the acquisition so we're probably looking at you know 900 million to a billion range it would have been a very yeah. big gamble for the company to 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 take because you know essentially it's it's it's, it's a pretty big chunk of their uh, market cap and it would essentially be the entirety of their cash reserves so <laughs> uh, you know I, I can imagine that they really had to work the numbers and uh, you know the other thing is that it would have been weird for Twitter that it's looking to you know would have been good in the sense that Twitter is looking for uh, a partner that could increase uh, uh, engagement of users user base. And, and it makes in that sense it makes sense on the other side though Twitter is also really looking at increasing its uh, uh, revenues and uh, buying a company that would require an, ex an expensive licensing solution around it and also would require for Twitter to invent a business model around it uh, because SoundCloud hasn't quite uh, found a way to monetize it on a B2C uh, level yet. Uh, it, it would have been a big challenge, right? <laughs> it's not the easiest yeah. thing to do. So, so in that sense, you know, probably it made sense for Twitter to walk away. Uh, you know, Alejandro, do you think that it's going to be hard for SoundCloud to figure out how to monetize uh, on a B2C basis uh, their service, or is it just going to be advertising? Well, I think so. I, th I think it's pretty hard for them to figure it out. You know, as long as the user still has problems uploading content because of licenses, the user, I believe, will just uh, continue to walk away from SoundCloud and SoundCloud will continue to uh, present a little erosion of the of those uh, of those users. So um, I don't know. I, I as a user sometimes get very frustrated by what happens on SoundCloud because of the licensing agreements that they currently have and how my content is uh, uh, constantly being blocked or just you know. Uh, being being torn down from from the website or the or or the social media streaming site. Yeah. So uh, and 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 I'm pretty sure that a lot of people, especially who are in the radio business and can use use SoundCloud for bigger purposes than it is being used right now, can't. You know. Uh, so I think that. Uh, they got to sit down with the record labels. They got to sit down with the performance agencies. They got to sit down with all those organizations and figure it out uh, by themselves in order to get things going and get things a little bit uh, uh, bigger and faster, you know? Yeah. And Christiana, uh, the, from, with an attorney hat on, do you think that uh, SoundCloud would have a better chance of uh, getting reasonable terms from rights holders as a standalone company or as part of a bigger entity where, you know, they might be more tempted to say, well, actually, we want, you know, half a million or a million of advance? <laughs> It might have helped them to combine forces with Twitter as far as working out some of the deals on more reasonable terms. But I mean, they're already becoming a powerhouse and something that the labels need to pay attention to because it, this is more of a consumer market. You know, you have people that you know who was Andy Warhol used to talk about the 15 minutes of fame, and now it's really 15 seconds of fame, and everybody's got a YouTube channel, and everybody's right. on SoundCloud doing mashups and mixups, and you know, everybody wants to get in this creative field but they're pulling from resources and not everybody can become an expert in music licensing. It's just yeah. too complicated. Nobody's interested <laughs> from that lay perspective. <laughs> yeah. So the companies have to get on board and, and work with the rights holders to figure this out and to make it where it, it works for the consumer, where the consumer can start to do these things and explore it and also, you know, look out for the artists. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. And it's, it's interesting, actually, that we're seeing so many leaks coming out of companies right now as far as, uh, you know, uh, 
no knowing when uh, talks are happening between you know talks that really should be private and and i don't think it's particularly good for the companies involved unless they are trying to throw feelers out to work out how the market is reacting to that rumor because you know facebook did really well out of uh, just announcing acquisitions like that of uh, instagram uh, that of uh, oculus rift they just kind of came out with it and managed to close the deals really quickly not make anything leak and it was just kind of like this is happening deal with it uh, whilst you know with a, also with the apple beats thing we've seen uh, from the rumor coming out we've seen hundreds of articles pros and cons lots of uh, you know debate around whether it's a good thing or not and i, I don't know whether that's good for the companies involved uh, uh, i don't know if you have any any opinions on that or whether the leaks are good or not uh, uh, christian i've seen a lot of leaks that are very intentional um <laughs> so you know there's also Definitely. the whole pr push where you know you you have to kind of question whether or not the company is releasing this through people in the know and <laughs> yeah. you know i I, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, because, I mean, if it's a talks between SoundCloud and Twitter, you know, right. the people in the know that would leak this information to, uh, you know, a recode would be either people from SoundCloud or Twitter. You know, it just seems right. weird that a lawyer, you know, the lawyers are bound by confidentiality. They couldn't really leak this stuff. So <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I don't see any harm to Twitter or SoundCloud because we're talking about them and yeah. a lot of people are today, yeah. you know? Exactly. So, I wouldn't be surprised if that was a, a PR rep doing their job today. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the next story revolves around the Dead Mouse subscription app. And first of all, I'm going to play a five minute interview I recorded yesterday with the CEO of, of Upfront Media, the company that has built the app. It's a real pleasure to welcome Ray Lee, the CEO of the company Upfront, to the show this week. So, Ray, uh, the company has received quite a bit of press and attention in the last couple of days due to the Dead Mouse iOS app, which expands the ecosystem of his subscription service uh, from uh, the website to mobile. So, uh, Dead Mouse's subscription has actually been live for a few months uh, since December, and uh, you were pow powering the web experience as well. So, tell us a little bit more about Upfront and uh, how you came to work with Dead Mouse. Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you for um, inviting me on this Great program. To have you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so we uh, Upfront is a um, a technology company that provides a subscription based uh, content distribution service for artists, musicians, celebrities, and um, and also other types of um, uh, influencers. And we we do this both on web and mobile. Um, and we do this in a way that is for that's privately branded for artists like Dead Mouse, as well as uh, we provide a community for other artists that um, could also join the Upfront network. Um, we launched in May of, tw of 2013, and um, we launched with uh, several uh, kind of known artists such as uh, Deepak Chopra, Maxwell, uh, Hillsong United, which is a very popular Christian rock band. Um, and then we did uh, launch Dead Mouse, as you mentioned in uh, December of 2013. Great. And, and so was he looking for a solution uh, to a problem that he had in terms of trying to monetize <clears throat> the families and providing them something extra? Yeah. <clears throat> Basically, Dead Mouse, uh, Joel Zimmerman, uh, wanted to uh, create an experience that was more intimate, more private, that uh, he wanted to share some of those experiences with. And he felt that those other social networks, which are great for the whole world to see and the world to listen to, um, they didn't necessarily serve that purpose. They didn't allow him to really go intimately involved and uh, share things that he would normally he wouldn't normally share share with the world. Um, so he really wanted to create a private community just dedicated for his uh, most loyal fan base. That's great. And so uh, Upfront, uh, of course, uh, you have a standalone app, uh, which is called Upfront, that people can check out with a number of <laughs> subscriptions that are available there from uh, Robbie Williams uh, to <coughs> even actors like uh, Dylan McDermott, for example. Uh, and, but was this your first uh, standalone uh, app subscription app or had you done anything before? <coughs> no, uh, Dead Mouse was our first uh, uh, white label subscription app. Um, and, you know, for, for someone uh, like Dead Mouse, um, we felt that we wanted to create his own community and uh, his own dedicated community. So uh, for, for Dead Mouse, we did uh, develop the website, as you mentioned, which is uh, live.deadmouse.com back in December. And then we released the, uh, the iPhone app, uh, which was released on Thursday. And then we are going to release an Android version on May 29th. Um, and it is, again, designed for um, his, real, his real super fans, his loyalists, people that really want to share 
uh, they're like-minded um, EDM fans as well as Dead Mouse fans. Yeah, sure. And so looking at uh, uh, porting that from from web to mobile, uh, which is a, a much more complex experience, I guess, than uh, a standard a standard subscription that you'd have on the on the other app. So uh, would that have more uh, features uh, uh, for the standalone white label version? Um, in terms of the subscription, or the or in the... terms of the subscription, because I know you have some chat functionality and message boards and all sorts of stuff on there. Yes, <clears throat> so those features are very engaging, as you can imagine. Um, they're very interactive. They, uh, we did offer those features on his web version as right. well. Yeah, and um, and what was we what we saw, which was pretty amazing, is uh, a dwell time of thirty minutes on average of people experiencing the app, but also sitting in the chat room and not only chatting with Joel. Dead Mouse, but also uh, chatting with each other, like-minded fans of Dead Mouse. Yeah, and um, and so for thirty minutes to dwell is pretty pretty high, and so what we're finding now is that the engagement is is going to be uh, hopefully a lot higher with mobile because as you know, it's, uh, if you have the mobile device, you're likely to be more interactive and more engaging in terms of chat functionality, as you mentioned, as well as maybe posting more on the on the fan forums that uh, that Dead Mouse is calling message boards. Um, so we did create those tools specifically that to design for mobile users. Um, and there's also a new feature that we added, which was to be able to integrate Joel's live streams embedded into the chat room. Right. So you could actually watch Joel streaming live and you could chat while you're watching him stream live in the studio, for example. Yeah, and, and looking at uh, the kind of clients that you have for the uh, for the upfront uh, uh, app, uh, you have a, a number of different uh, type of people. Of, of course, I mentioned actors. You even have you know a new age guru, guru uh, Deepak Chopra on, on, on the on the app. So, uh, how are you seeing the the inquiries that are coming in? Do you see a lot of uh, artists primarily, or do you see a lot of other types of personalities that are looking at finding more intimate ways of engaging with their audience? Yeah, <clears throat> it's great. I mean, it's we're seeing all of the above. Um, I think for, from our perspective, we, anyone that is, has uh, a certain level of influence that has a, has a following or some fans or supporters, it could be an artist, like you mentioned, it could be a thought leader, it could be a musician, it could be a, a celebrity chef, it could be an athlete, or it could be a brand. And so right. uh, we feel that, uh, that this, this, this service is, it could be available and useful for all types of, uh, all, all types of influencers. Um, we definitely see the, the biggest opportunity in the artist slash musician space um, because we feel that they're having uh, more challenging times to monetize yep. their content, um, both through digital uh, downloads as well as streaming services. And so this just gives them another way to, to perhaps like put out unreleased music, to put out um, you know, some backstage photos and videos that no one else would see. Right. Um, and really just click, and our end goal is really to close that gap between the fans and the artists. And we feel that this is the best way to do so. EDM, electronic music artists are, are a very big target for us because um, they're always producing content. Right. And, and people are in many ways want access to them and are willing to spend money for access. Um, and this is a good way to access uh, a, a, a DJ like that else. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, of course, it puts the pressure on for artists that are doing this to produce a, a content on a regular basis, which uh, is definitely a challenge in itself. <laughs> very good point, definitely. And, and from our point of view, we've created some really good publishing tools that are very easy to use. Um, so Dope Dead Mouse and other artists will have uh, a, a publishing platform that really that's mobile and web like a CMS, and it's not only for Joel or Dead Mouse or other artists or influencers on our platform, but it's also for their teams. So yeah. their teams could have access to a web CMS and upload some amazing content they, would, they may capture backstage, for instance. That's awesome, and uh, uh, that sounds um, amazing, and uh, I'm sure uh, lots of the listeners of DMT are going to check out the app if they haven't already, and thanks so much for your time, Ray. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me on the show. And again, uh, go and check out BeUpfront.com for more information on the company. Uh, Alejandro, do you think that uh, uh, talking about Dead Mouse uh, subscriptions for super fans and uh, subscriptions for different artists, do you think that this is a viable way to monetize for artists? I don't know, Andrea. I don't think it's a good idea. I think, I mean, recording recorded music as a business is pretty hard right now as it is, you know, and it's all over the place. You know, you can find it on YouTube, you can find it on the torrents, you can find it on the streaming services, you know, and most of it apparently is free. You know, it's like it's what everybody says when they offer you a streaming service is, oh, get 30 million songs for free on your mobile phone or on your iPad and stuff like that. So I think that no matter how uh, how hard Dead Mouse tries to monetize his recorded music, you know, the fan is, uh, I believe, 
particularly Dead Mouse's fan, is going to find it somewhere on the web, somewhere on the ether, whether it's licensed or not, whether somebody is paying for it or not. You know, they're going to be able to find it. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, the, 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 I think the purpose of the app is more to monetize that relationship so that fans can be part of the ecosystem. It's, I don't think it's about distributing music, uh, whilst more it's about uh, being able to be in a chat with him or communicate okay, with okay. other fans. So I, I wonder whether, you know, monetizing the experience is something that can work as opposed to actually trying to monetize the, the recorded music, which is going to be available anywhere, uh, everywhere. So that's, that's not a big deal. Uh, I, right. I don't know, uh, Christian, do you think that there's something here? Uh, and, uh, you know, do you feel like there's only a certain type of artist that could go for this kind of monetization or is it open to pretty much everybody? I have seen it work for multiple levels of artists. Um, and I think we're in a, uh, we're in an interesting time where a lot of people have been exploring the Kickstarters of the world and all of these in Pantheon, you know, where you're asking, Hey, I'm going to upload this video either way. It's going to be free, right. but you know, support me, give me a dollar, give me $2, you know, and every video I put on the web, you're supporting me continuing to do that or you're supporting me continue to do my craft and music. Right. So I've seen it work where fans are very supportive, but I think there is, you know, a tipping point <laughs> where fans <laughs> are going to start getting very, very tired of, okay, I'm not paying for exclusivity. I'm paying to be part of this little fan group or, you know, people pay for experience still. So, you know, if they're having exclusive conversations um, with the artists or if there's, you know, uh, Skype calls. I've seen stuff like that work in these fan base uh, type subscription services. Yeah. Um, paying for exclusivity as far as tracks and things, which is what I understand this to be. Um, you know, I agree with Alejandro. I think it's going to be everywhere. It's going to leak. Um, and I think there is going to be still some fan support to, to just want to support the groups that you love for a certain point of time. And then people are just going to get sick of it. Yeah, I mean, um, it's going to be very hard on the artists. Uh, uh, we we're talking about uh, uh, the fact that, of course, you're going to have to keep uh, a very consistent stream of content going into these applications in order to have people carry on subscribing. So, uh, you know, you can't have the usual lulls. And, I mean, that's kind of the way the business is going anyway with the uh, constant cycles of releases and a lot of singles rather than albums. So, in, in that sense, it makes sense, but it also does put the pressure on artists uh, in, in saying, you know, you can't go on holiday for two weeks and just leave. You have to keep <laughs> updating right. this thing. Otherwise, Fans are going to start going and thinking, oh, what, what's going on here? <laughs> yeah, and well, I, I also think based. that the, and, and <laughs> I also think that the, the, the biggest experience that you can have or get from an artist, and I'm talking from the South American point of view, where, you know, like bringing an artist or booking an artist as big as Dead Mouse is, you know, huge numbers, it's huge money, and uh, it, it represents the, the, the consumer. Uh, significant part of his wage here and everything i think that uh, if if dead mouse wants to uh, you know monetize he's got to continue to tour he's got to continue to get closer to audiences he's got to be open to not just you know doing big festivals he's got to be open to going back to the club scene to make it more intimate to make it more intimate for the user who's been with him or the consumer who's been with him for over 10 years you know i think that it's all about the live experience when it comes to musicians right right so that's i mean it's, it's a very interesting model and uh, uh I, I i looked at the app and, and it looks really uh, really great uh, so excited to see where that goes of course i, I wrote a piece uh, saying that it's going to be hard to gauge how these uh, processes are working out because a lot of these are coming from massive artists and it's going to be a lot easier for them to quietly shut down experiences like these that are not quite working than releasing the actual numbers and letting us know whether they're working or not so uh definitely a uh, an area that we're going to keep an eye on hopefully we'll, we'll have some label uh, people tell us a little bit more about how the how the how, how the, those are going and there's uh, there's actually a uk company uh, called uh, superpass uh, which is uh, working in a similar vertical but for uh, unsigned and much smaller artists where people are pledging um or you know paying x amount a month and they're receiving an exclusive track a month or uh contact with the band and that kind of thing so uh, a few different companies working in this space is definitely a one to keep an eye on and uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, you know uh, 
streaming as usual uh, i wanted to uh, address uh, shortly uh, a lawsuit that happened this week uh, around the beats music so it wasn't uh, it was only a few days after uh, you know the rumors that apple might be acquiring the company that we've uh, heard uh, signs uh, of the first lawsuit coming towards uh, beats music of all things actually considering that beats electronics has quite a an interesting history uh, an interesting past uh, it was interesting to see that beats music was the first one to have a lawsuit and it comes from david hyman who's uh, the founder of mog is a streaming service service that was purchased by Beats uh, and turned into Beats Music. So he claims that he was unfairly dismissed by the company due to, due to a disagreement over a layoff uh, and uh, he was set to receive 1% uh, of Beats Music after a year uh, at the company but he was laid off before that and so that never happened. Also he was supposed to get uh, I think 25% uh, of the company's outstanding interests if the market cap reached 500 million which it may have given that uh, the company uh, is being purchased by Apple for quite a, a steep amount although we don't know what the division between Beats Electronics and Beats Music is yet if it's going to happen uh, we haven't really heard anything in the last 10 days about this uh, and so he's now seeking 20 million dollars which appear to be calculated on him getting uh, the full 2.5 percent equity based on a 800 million valuation of the company so uh, christian from a legal point of view uh, it's a bit odd to see an employment based lawsuit uh, come uh, you know this was happening in november 2012 so we're like a year and a half away from this uh, uh, you know and it's clearly just because of the acquisition talk. So, would, would, would yeah. this uh, really stand stand up in court? And and how how would the court deal with uh, such a late claim? Uh, it's not actually a late claim. In right. the, this was filed in Los Angeles County, and it was filed as a breach of contract, which was a written contract. So, the statute of limitations is actually four years. So he right. could have sat on it longer, which does make the timing of this with the uh, three point two billion acquisition um, very. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, very intentional. Let's say um, it, the interesting thing, though, I I, I pulled the complaint and uh, I read it last night. I think, and from what I remember, um, it was an at will uh, agreement, an employment agreement. Right. So they could terminate at will for any reason, um, as long as it's not discriminatory. That's not the allegation here. The allegation is that he was entitled to hire and fire. That was part of his contract with Daisy and that he fired a problematic employee and that all of a sudden uh, they fired him for that. Um, and so they're, they're making some interesting arguments in the complaint that, well, that's really a, a breach of the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing here because this was an, you know, an important part of the contract, an important right that he had. Yeah. And if they're going to fire him for exercising that right, then doesn't it make it moot? I yeah. think we're going to see the other side file a demur um, which is just a way to attack the pleadings from the outset saying yeah. this was an at-will agreement. It's attached to the complaint. So just on the face of the complaint alone, we were within our rights and, and he's not going to have grounds to, to bring this lawsuit. And if, if they survive demur, it's going to go away in a quiet settlement. Yeah. <laughs> That's my call. Well, thanks for, <laughs> thanks for the insight. That was really interesting. And uh, Alejandro, do you, how do you feel about the Beats Apple thing? Uh, we've talked about it on the show at length, but we haven't heard anything in 10 days. So uh, this looks starting to look a little bit shaky, right? Yes, definitely. It sounds like a lot of hype, you know. It, it's like uh, you get all this information and all of a sudden just everything seems to disappear. I'm not really sure what's going to what's gonna come out of all of it. But if it does come out, I think that, uh, you know, everything is going to be very exciting. It's going to be quite fun to see what happens with uh, once those two get together and start uh, working. However, you know, like Christian said at the beginning of the conversation, you know, there's so much hype going on around technology. I mean, there's so many people talking so many things and all of a sudden all you get is noise. You don't yeah. get a clear signal, you know. And this is pretty much like one of the biggest examples of the past 10 days. However, you know, it's it's uh, it's made up for for a lot of interesting and fun reading, you know. Yeah, absolutely. It, 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 together with the Twitter thing that, uh, you know, uh, created a Twitter storm, uh, kind of, uh, <laughs> funnily enough, uh, yeah. uh, you know, on Monday night uh, and lots of posts uh, uh, with opinions on what would happen if Twitter acquired SoundCloud. Uh, again, with Apple and Beats, we've seen hundreds of posts come out. So uh, if right. nothing else, we could have we could make up a book of uh, everybody's opinions on what would happen if, yes. that, <laughs> if that was the case. <laughs> so but is it, is it really... Uh, Andrea, do you think it's really going to happen? I mean, is it is is it really going to take place? 
it's i think it's kind of strange i mean it's definitely outside of apple's uh, uh mo uh app so far it would really consist of a break uh in, in apple's tradition of not acquiring high profile brands but then again apple is uh sort of struggling with maintaining the uh, download sales where they are you know they're definitely declining and that's uh, obvious to everybody in the industry especially in north america and in, U and in europe um they need to find another solution and what are they going to do i mean Perhaps this is a good move, and also the you know the wearable side of things could be helpful with the headphones. But uh, I don't know. Apple is kind of a, a fickle company. I think if uh, even just the fact that uh, uh, there was that leaked video with Dre uh, jumping around saying that he was the first yeah. uh, a hip hop billionaire, that could have been enough to put Apple off because they're kind of weird like that. And <laughs> so we're gonna have to we're gonna have to wait and see what happens on that one. Uh, it, it is weird that we're not hearing any more on it, but it may still well it may still happen. Uh, it may still happen. And uh, uh, Alejandro, I wanted to ask you actually about Michael Jackson. So, uh, you know, the web went mental on Sunday night after uh, the Billboard Music Awards, uh, uh, where uh, a Michael Jackson hologram, which could also be labeled as a very creepy ghost uh, <laughs> like thing, uh, performed a new track actually. So, this, is, this wasn't uh, actually stock footage, it was, it was generated. Uh, a new track called Love Never Felt So Good from his uh, latest uh, posthumous release. And uh, there were lots of different opinions on the web as to whether this was a great success or a terrifying prospect in, in the sense of uh, an actual tour of Michael Jackson uh, being hologrammed around uh, venues across the world. And, uh, you know, have you had any reactions from your audience on the, on the radio station? And, you know, I, I don't have that much contact with, uh, uh, with the people. You know, I'm, I'm cooped up here in my studio. But, but you, you have a lot of people calling in and, and, and telling you their opinion. So what did they think uh, uh, out in Colombia about this uh, hologram? And would they do you think they'd like to see it uh, come to a venue in Bogota? Well, they were very excited, Andrea. You know, last uh, you know that Sunday night was a very exciting uh, moment, TV moment for Colombian audiences. They pretty much love Michael Jackson down here, and I'm pretty sure that if this turned into a worldwide tour and it uh, contemplated Colombia for a few dates, you know, they would definitely sell out. Everybody was very happy and m some of them were pretty, you know, freaked out and creeped out by the entire thing <laughs> on stage. Yeah. But but in, in general terms, it was it was very exciting for the audiences here. They pretty much understood what was going on on stage. You know, yeah. some of us were very skeptical from the very beginning because uh, I think that there was a surprise factor that was killed by Billboard on the tweets and on the expectations right. that they try to, uh, you know, pull off with uh, with the television broadcast. I think it was unnecessary to create an expectation, and it would have been much more exciting to see it happen right. in front of the audiences who were there, just like they did in Coachella. I think that. You know that 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 particular thing was not was not as exciting, but in general terms, for you know the general public, it was a very exciting TV moment. And, and so, like, was it actually being broadcast in Colombia, or uh, did it, did it have to go online, or how did it work? It was it was it was broadcast on cable TV. All right. TNT had the had the rights. They usually have the rights to all the awards, and this was not the exception. So it was uh, you know Sunday night was TNT time. Yeah. Right. And uh, uh, Christian, do you think that uh, this is going to create a whole uh, other, you know, uh, problem for uh, the already complicated legal issues surrounding uh, estates of uh, deceased stars? <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, there was talk, uh, you know, at Coachella after Tupac Shakur made his resurrection. There was already talk from attorneys about, you know, name and likeness rights and all of these things and trademark and... Uh, you know, I mean, there's there's such a level, and obviously the the ones that have been created so far have had full estate support, and you know it's been very high profile. But you see it coming down the pipeline because you you have these people that lived in a different time where being a star was really being a star, and at this point you don't have that. You don't right. have these icons anymore, and and you may never be able to again because of just the amount. Yeah. Uh, you know, of music and the amount of availability. And, and so I think people long for that a little bit. And I think people want to see these iconal people back on stage, you know. Uh, and they're going to be, it's, it's just like music licensing. People are going yeah. to want to limit these rights, you know, limit the name and likeness rights. 
um, and the estates are going to say, okay, you can use it for this, but we have to have some creative control over how it's used because you can see the abuse that could come from it. Yeah. Um, yeah, along and with I mean, the creepiness. And we're talking <laughs> yeah. about we're talking about digital assets. So as with yeah. MP3s, as with the 3D printing plans, uh, uh, mm -hmm. as the cost of holographic projections uh, get cheaper, and we've already seen like that this particular uh, broadcast was surrounded by uh, legal problems so because the uh, Hologram USA and Musion, there are two hologram companies, uh, claimed that the Jackson Jackson Estate and the producers of Billboard used their tech without uh, a license. Uh, and I, I can I can just see like you know. Uh, a venue in, 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 in Italy or something, you know, being able to acquire the digital assets uh, to put this show together without actually having paid for it and, and all sorts of issues arising from that because, you know, all you need is a holographic projection and the asset files of the performance and, that, and, and well, you got it. And I don't, I don't think people could have ever anticipated that we'd all be able to, you know, sit on our garage band or whatever program and create songs of the drop of a hat and have all of these things available to us 50 years ago. That just was unheard of. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, who's to say that there's not going to be everybody with a holographic projector, you know, creating <laughs> parodies of people doing, you know, really unspeakable things. And, oh you know, I, I really see a lot of horrible things coming out of yes. with this technology too. But I like when it's, uh, when it's not abused. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and, and, you know, it can be very exciting when it's in the right hands. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, talking about, you know, the, the, the history of music, uh, I had a, a really great interview this week with uh, Jeremy Silver, the author of uh, uh, Digital Medieval, uh, which is a, a new book that he's written, and uh, that's for the uh, DMT one-to-one -one show. Uh, so uh, Digital Music Trends has uh, another show that comes out weekly, and some of, some of the listeners may not be aware of it. Uh, so uh, I've been trying to uh, raise the awareness of the show also by introducing some clips for, from uh, that uh, show uh, into the main news show. So here it is, uh, uh, my uh, five-minute segment of the uh, half an hour plus interview with uh, Jeremy Silver on the DMT one-to-one. It's a real pleasure to welcome to the show today Jeremy Silver as we're going to chat about uh, your new book called Digital Medieval, the first 20 years of music on the web. So hi Jeremy and thanks for joining me. How's it going? Hi Andres, great, good to be here. So it's a pleasure to have you and uh, Jeremy as a means of introduction for listeners of the show that uh, haven't heard about Jeremy before, he has been involved in the music industry for the past 20 years, uh, starting at 19, in 1992 at Virgin Records as Director of Media Affairs then becoming Vice President of New Media getting the first taste of the internet, then moving on to shape EMI's global digital strategy you also worked uh, at a music startup called Uplister for a time uh, during the dot-com boom and bust of the two early 2000s, you were the CEO of the Featured Artist Coalition for a time and also the CEO of Sibelius Software and uh, you're currently Executive Chairman at Symmetric and Chair at Music Glue so lots of stuff going on here Jeremy and, and it's great talking to you today and uh, so uh, first of all we're going to talk about uh, uh, the title of the book Digital Medieval uh, what spurred you to write the book and where does the title come from? So uh, I, I, I decided that it was worth trying to document uh, all the extraordinary things that happened in this period of, the, of, of 20 years. It feels like 20 years of the web sounds like an immense amount of time, and yet in a way, you know, the amount of things that have gone on in that period um, are far larger and far more than anyone could have imagined, I guess. And uh, but at the same time, uh, I have that strong feeling that in lots of ways, we're just at the beginning of all of this. Right. And so uh, the, the medieval idea was really all about uh, that sense of it being, you know, we're still in the dark ages, we're still feeling our way. And actually, of course, the, the medieval period was a period of great innovation, uh, uh, as well as one of, uh, of chaos and strife. And uh, that seemed in lots of ways to, to sum up uh, the kind of what we've experienced with music on the web. And uh, there was a, a lot of uh, ways in which the old rules and the, the simple ways in which things had worked before and the, the clarity of, uh, uh, of the church governing uh, the Western of Europe uh, was all disintegrating right. and the rules were all changing. And actually, when you think about, you know, music on the web, it, all the rules have changed all the time, and in lots of ways, uh, not just around music, actually broadly as well, there's that feeling um, that actually people are making up new ways of doing business all the time now, yeah. and, still, and still doing that. Yeah, of course. And, uh, and so um, uh, tell us a little bit about the companies that uh, you feel are the center of this uh, digital medieval period and, and, and how they are shaping the reality that we live in. 
Well, I think that, you know, when you, the, the obvious big players for us today have become uh, giants in the landscape. And, and really, when you think about the role that, that Google and Facebook and Amazon and Apple between them play, and I would say those four companies, uh, there are others as well, Twitter and Yahoo and so on. But it, I think if we just look at those four companies, they really are dominating the landscape. They're influencing the ways in which people are doing business. They're creating platforms around which whole ecosystems of businesses are being built. And uh, I, I, again, without wanting to push the medieval metaphor too far, it does strike me that there's a really interesting analogy there where these uh, the business models of these companies are all about trying to pull consumers in, all about, uh, if you like, a walled garden approach, right. uh, which, which, is, which is really about um, making sure that once we're involved in their, on their particular platform, that it becomes increasingly attractive to stay there and more and more difficult to leave. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that is, uh, uh, so, you know, what starts off as a walled garden eventually becomes more like a city-state. Sure. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, with, with Amazon and with Apple in particular, we're kind of really um, increasingly seeing ourselves drawn into being, you know, an Apple kind of a person or an Amazon kind of person. And actually, it becomes more and more difficult to be agnostic. Yeah. And you can find the full interview on the DMT One to One show. I want to talk about Shazam because uh, uh, Sony Universal and Warner Music have invested three million each in the company. So this is a very tiny stake, and they actually didn't invest directly. They bought uh, up, uh, you know, uh, an, an investor that uh, had gotten into Shazam early and wanted to exit, called Akasha Capital. And uh, you know, the, with the company being valued at about five hundred million dollars, this kind of equates to uh, around one percent of the company each. So it's not a significant amount, but it's an interesting move because usually uh, labels are used to getting equity stakes for free, uh, like uh, in, in the case of Spotify in exchange for agreeing to licensing the services. So, you know, we've heard rumors around uh, Shazam being integrated into iOS, which would be a very big deal. So this kind of seems like a big vote of confidence for, uh, from the industry uh, towards Shazam. So, uh, Alejandro, do you think that uh, that's the case? And, uh, uh, you know, in your mind, does it uh, consolidate the rumors that uh, Shazam will be uh, built into uh, iOS? Definitely. It sounds like a very interesting idea and something that the major labels are very interested in getting into probably because uh, even though the declining uh, download sale landscape seems to be lurking and uh, uh, along the horizon and uh, streaming seems to be taken over there's still a lot of money to be made on downloads and i think that shazam helps that market go forward and it will continue to help uh, many more recorded music markets such as the streaming ones so yes i i, I see it possible andrea yeah yeah uh, uh christiana uh, do you feel like uh, this is in any way significant it's kind of a weird move right buying out a, a, a an investor to get into the company it, it means that they really feel like this is going to go somewhere i don't think it's weird at all i i think also that you know I, all all three of the major labels should be doing this, and I'm sure they're right. in talks with Universal. If they're not, you know, if they are not, they're going to be very soon, and they'll probably do the exact same thing. Because, it, you know, and like like we're all saying, it, 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 we use Shazam all the time because there, there's so much music out there, and especially the radio stations, you know, used to be there <laughs> yeah. to help market <laughs> and promote artists. And now they're just playing stuff, and half the time you don't know what it is. And, you know, you can hear this wonderful piece of music and be like, oh, what is that? And the DJ just, you know, plows right over it. Yeah. So <laughs> at least in the States, it's horrible, horrible. Um, so, you know, we use Shazam all the time or you'll hear it in a store yeah. or, you know, at a restaurant be like, oh, I really like this. And I thought, I thought music off of Shazam, you know, just <clears throat> being able to pinpoint an ID that music is a very important aspect of, you know, living in a needle in a haystack environment when it comes to music. And I think, it's smart of the labels and they should all be on board, yeah, absolutely. You know, even if it's a small stake. Absolutely. And uh, I want to talk about uh, uh, web channels and web apps. So uh, Love Live, a UK-based music media company that brings together brands, broadcasters, online platforms and labels, has announced the launch of a new app available to begin with only on LG smart TVs called Love Live TV. So the app provides consumers with videos of live performances. You, you can you can sort of uh, picture the how it's going to work, you know, well-known and emerging artists, interviews, uh, backstage footage and all sorts of stuff on there. 
and it will have built-in live streaming capabilities so uh, you know love live managed to back some high profile artists for the launch including katy perry disclosure jesse j and ben howard and uh, uh, of course you know it's pretty restricted right now uh, to lg smart tvs and i think it might be a uk only deal i, I don't know whether it's available internationally to be honest uh, but I, I wanted to talk about it sort of in on a more uh, you know broader profile as well you know that we're seeing a lot of different uh, entities come into the streaming and uh, smart tv streaming space uh, you know uh, revolt tv with the sean combs uh, has got a big online presence as well as being a cable network uh, vice is extremely successful uh, with its online video work and of course vivo as well is very present on all these platforms mm -hmm. including the apple tv so how do you see these fit into the mainstream world as uh, people start moving away from cable start exploring these new devices and uh, and how do you see these apps maybe replacing normal channels in a sense uh, in the future mm. anybody want to take it up i don't think it's going to be a replacement i think right, right now it's an experiment um because uh, you know uh, you're never going to replace the experience of a live show but for some artists, you know, there is a drop off where we're just getting lazy as a society yeah. and, <laughs> and it's a little sad, but I mean, we're, we're so focused on exploring all of the opportunities in the digital realm and, and with my artist hat on, I mean, I've done staged and new stream shows and things like that. And it, it, the live show is irreplaceable. I mean, right. the interaction with people you know, you're talking about being cooped up in your studio, <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> we need human interaction and yeah. it's not ever going to be replaced by an app or a TV. Um, but, you know, I think it's exploratory right now. You know, I mean, there, MTV doesn't play music videos. They don't play, <laughs> you know, music at all anymore. You know? <laughs> so I think they're exploring would people watch yeah. if we put this out there and it will be interesting to see if they do. Yeah, yeah, Alejandro, yeah. Uh, how do you feel about this? Of course, uh, this could be interesting in countries, especially like uh, Colombia, uh, where you may not have uh, as much of a wide offering on, on your TV, TV or cable networks uh, when it comes to music. Yeah, definitely. I think that live performances continue to be very exciting uh, for streaming users. Now, the problem we have right now is that our infrastructure in terms of 4G is not as big or as wide or as right. popular as we would, uh, we would like it to be. However... Uh, what we are seeing right now, as uh, Christiane said, is an exploration of all kinds of media. And I believe that uh, some, at some point, th there's going to be a convergence point. And th I believe that the TV is key and whatever it is that happens with all these streaming platform services and apps, you know, as, uh, there, there's, I believe that there's going to be a point where all our TVs are smart enough to you know, get all kinds of content together and connect them to the home, which is one of the big uh, dilemmas that are still right now taking place in terms of how the user spends his time yeah. consuming music and apps and how he pays for them or not. You know, yeah. I believe that that's going to be key in whatever it is that happens in the near future, not only for, for the developed market, such as your market and Christian's market, but also here now we see a lot of the uh, big streams going on you going on on youtube you know from big festivals such as the ultra music festival or lalapalooza yeah. or coachella on, on youtube and they got huge numbers in terms of you know if you could call it ratings so it would be very exciting to see that develop here yeah, and, and one of the uh, key things actually that I should point out is the fact that right now we're in a really fragmented space when it comes to uh, apps as well and smart TVs. Unfortunately, uh, we are, uh, you know, uh, every single uh, TV has got its own system. Essentially, we are not in an environment where everybody's using Android, for example, and the company can just make an app that's going to work across Samsung TVs, LG TVs, and all sorts of other devices. So I think that's going to be really a key part of uh, trying to figure out how this works to try and consolidate sure. a little bit the app experience otherwise a company like love live is going to have to try and make uh, uh, 15 bespoke uh, versions of their app for 15 different devices that change all the time and that's not really scalable right right i i believe in that too i think that you know as mulligan wrote on the music industry blog a, uh, a couple of weeks ago you know talking about content connectors you know but th there was a time in, uh, in the 80s where, you know, all companies or particular hardware companies or, you know, like television uh, manufacturing companies or uh, CD manufacturers or, you know, stereo manufacturers were pretty much, you know, 
platform agnostic is what he called it and right. th that's uh, that's pretty much what's lacking right now you know we don't have that uh, that uh, platform agnostic uh, thing going on you know back in those days they would get together and say okay let's agree on the cd and they would go out and manufacture the cd and work out a different kind of implementation for the stereos or whatever but all that's pretty much gone now but i think that if you look at it uh, from the tv and the smart tv standpoint you could find a way out of that dilemma, don't you, Andrea? Yeah, I can say I can say that. I mean, uh, I have to say, you know, I really hope things are going to get better on the apps front. I have an 18 months old uh, uh, smart uh, DVD Blu-ray uh, Blu-ray player from LG that is a piece of crap. Uh, it really doesn't work very well. It crashes all the time. You know, it takes ages to load any uh, sort of uh, on-demand service. So, and I'm sure that as process uh, processors get faster, uh, you know, the service is going to improve. But I think there's a lot of work that needs to be made in the user experience of these devices from manufacturers that perhaps are not as used to create interesting user experiences uh, as you know maybe the likes of Apple or even Microsoft with Xbox uh, uh, so you know definitely a learning curve there I think for a company like LG that uh, wasn't used to making uh, software but it, it may have to uh, well it has to right now and uh, right. <laughs> and uh, uh, well I wanted to close with uh, uh, the last story about Spotify actually I think it's quite an interesting one that we can discuss uh, and uh, I'd, I'd love to hear your points of view on this uh, so Spotify has uh, finally decided to take a more proactive approach in encouraging band, bands to add uh, uh, their music Music to the service so essentially previously if uh, the likes of Coldplay or Beyonce didn't want to have their latest album on Spotify it just didn't, didn't appear on, on, on the service it just wasn't there uh, now Spotify has actually changed their policy and they're actually showing the album and the and the track list on the service uh, but it's grayed out and the company has added a message uh, that uh, uh, says uh, 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 written it down somewhere uh, essentially you know it uh, <laughs> this artist hates oh. you and they're not putting yeah. your music <laughs> uh, it says oh, I should have found it sorry uh, my, my, my eyes were uh, uh, losing it a little bit uh, so it says the artists or the representatives have decided not to release this album on Spotify we are working on it and hope they will change their mind soon so this is a, a very sort of passive aggressive message right <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so you know this is uh, is happening for the Coldplay album and for the Beyonce album I think uh, and I'm sure for any other high profile release that the labels decide to withhold from from the service. So uh, do you reckon this approach might work? You know if if uh, subscribers that are also fans of the band start emailing Coldplay going what the hell is going on? Why is your label not adding the album to the service? Uh, you know I'm paying for Spotify. Do you think that might sway uh, artists to adding their albums to Spotify or would just piss them off? I uh, don't could be. think it's going to sway the artists because I think the fans already are very aware of what albums they're looking for that aren't on Spotify and they're already reaching out on Twitter and other forums right. and you know contacting the artists. I think I think it's almost just Spotify getting itself off the hook a little bit like it's not our decision. We right. love you. We want this to be here, but they won't let us. Yeah. Um a little bullying. But um, <laughs> <laughs> frankly, <laughs> but um, but they're not doing it for everything. It, it is the high-profile um, album, so it, you know I think they're targeting the labels and saying, you know, come play with us because yeah. this is where everything's going. <laughs> yeah, Alejandro, yeah. I, I was in, in, intrigued actually. Uh, I know that you've traveled to the U.S. Uh, uh, quite a bit. So have you found that there are differences in the catalog that you can access uh, from Colombia uh, to the one that you can access from the U.S. or is it pretty much the same? Oh, no, no, definitely. There's a lot of differences between what you find available in, in the U.S. on Spotify and what you find here, you know. Right. You know, re regions are so, so, so different when it comes to digital content. It's so hard to get everybody in the same bag. I don't, I don't really know how they pull it off right now. You know, it's amazing. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I think that um, it, it's just getting started. Started, you know, um, artists like Hani El Khatib from California. You know, you can't really find those guys licensed here, and right. you you see all the editors at Spotify working, you know, their butts off to get you know that catalog in in the Colombian region or in the Andean region or the South American region, what have you. And it's pretty hard. So yeah. yes, there's major major differences, you know, but. Uh, whatever it is that's happening in terms of those, you know, like independent artists or maybe some of the uh, major label artists who are not licensed, such as, I don't know, like Phil Collins, for example, 
you probably you probably won't find any music by Phil Collins on Spotify or on Deezer here because it's right. just not licensed yet. Yeah. But uh, as far as as far as I'm concerned, you know, I I think that people continue to consume what's new on on the streaming services and what's available through radio and major uh, outlets right now. I don't yeah. think that there's still uh, 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 delivery of the promise of l new independent artists being discovered by by the major uh, uh, streaming services. I think that it's still pretty much controlled by the labels, by the major labels, and I think that there's not a lot of difference going on there. So, you know, whether or not there's a big difference in catalog, it doesn't really matter at this point in Colombia. Yeah. Yeah, and we'll continue to see that, especially in the South American market, there's a, a big stronghold in Miami, for example, of, of lots of major labels that are uh, controlling mm -hmm. the market from there. And, you know, the, the, definitely uh, a space where uh, they have a lot of clout still uh, because of the distribution sure. channels that you were talking about that are kind, yeah. of, that are kind of constrained. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an exciting time. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I wonder what's... Uh, what's going to happen uh, in, in the next uh, 6 to 12 months, uh, especially in South America, is going to be a very interesting space to, to look out for. Uh, um, actually, I am planning to record a Brazil special in a couple of weeks. Hopefully, it will, it will come, come out. Uh, it's going to be a pretty tough to organize. We have uh, some very interesting players from the Brazilian music industry that are going to join us. And it's sort of like a pre-World Cup special uh, wow. for the 11th of June. So hopefully, that's going to happen. And uh, it's going to be awesome. Uh, we're going to talk about the Brazil Brazilian music industry, what's happening and uh, what uh, kind of uh, opportunities uh, the World Cup is bringing for uh, that uh, market. Uh, and that's pretty much it for this week. I just want to mention a couple of things uh, that I didn't manage to cover and that we don't have time to cover because we've already run, uh, run quite late. Uh, so first of all, Epidemic Sound, uh, which is a, a Swedish company that is uh, building a library of uh, music free of PRO's, PRO constraints uh, to easily license them to video producers, has raised the five millions in a series, series A round of funding. Uh, to fuel the growth of its catalog and expand its presence uh, on the ground to more territories. And another company that is dipping its toes into the music licensing business is uh, Shutterstock. Uh, the stock image giant has launched its music section on its web website. I think it's just uh, uh, shutterstock.com slash music. And it aims to make it super easy for companies to find the right music for their video productions, which is on a flat fee basis. So uh, this is kind of predictable because uh, we've seen a company like Getty Music, which is a competitor of Shutterstock, uh, come into this space. Uh, now four years ago and they have a pretty big music division so it makes sense for uh, Shutterstock to enter the market even though they're doing it in partnership with the Rumblefish which is providing the uh, uh, majority of the catalog that's available right now and uh, that's uh, pretty much it uh, I think I may have skipped a couple of news in the in the process but uh, it's always hard to cover everything that's happening this was a particularly full week and uh, uh, I wanted to ask you uh, of course uh, what you're working on Alejandro anything interesting that you want to talk to us about uh, before we go uh, either from your work or what's happening in Colombia right now? No, we continue to work on uh, the musicpimp.com. I mean, right. offering the best uh, information on technology and music industry right now in Colombia and in South America. We're very, we're, we're very much uh, looking forward to what's going to happen with Spotify and the bundling of the, of the telco. And uh, we continue to work here on the radio on uh, laxmasmusica.com for all those of you watching the digital music trends or listening to the digital music trends webcast or podcast we're right there on the web like ismasmusica.com that's great and you'll find the links to the station in the show notes as well and to the uh, mu the music pimp blog of course uh, too which is uh, uh, very easy to read even if you don't speak spanish spanish because on chrome you just get a translate option and that's super easy to do uh, i speak a bit of spanish but it's, it's not great and uh, uh, christian on, on your end uh, you know you you could have a million things to plug because you know just your releases are, are awesome but you know in general <laughs> what, what would you focus on today oh gosh um well it's not fully up to speed, but I had had a lot of people ask about um, where they could find all of my CD Baby uh, posts in one place. So I finally opened up musicalredhead.com, and so I'm using that to archive all of my CD Baby blogs about music law and licensing issues. So, um, so I'll just plug that as a, uh, as a good resource for musicians um, and people interested in music law. Um, it's a fun, light read for law. And, uh, <laughs> and you'll enjoy it. And I promise I will write more soon. I have um, 80 pages of uh, questions that I haven't gotten to yet. And I'm wow. so sorry. It's just, <laughs> you know, 
clients first. <laughs> yeah, when you're blogging on a platform as big as City Baby, it can get quite overwhelming, right? You get a lot, yeah. a lot of questions. So <laughs> that's yeah, awesome. Yeah, and they're exciting. I really want to. I want to get them to you guys. So I'll do that soon. <laughs> Perfect. Well, it was an absolute pleasure having you both, and thanks uh, as well to all the other guests that joined us for uh, segments of this show. Uh, you can find Digital Music Trends uh, on uh, uh, iTunes, uh, on YouTube, on SoundCloud. You can listen to it. You can watch it. Uh, and uh, I'm also hoping to start segmentizing it so you can find different uh, snippets of the show on YouTube. Uh, and uh, thanks so much for listening. And once again, if you want to send any feedback on what you heard or if you want to comment on the stories, if you disagreed with us on anything, just email uh, contact at digitalmusictrends.com or tweet us on at digimusictrends. Have a fantastic week and until uh, next time. Bye.